Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's been a long time since I was asked to teach here. I don't know what I did wrong last time, <laughs> but evidently it's been so long that they've forgotten. A lot of times when you get asked to fill a pulpit um, on a weekend, uh, most of the time the pastor will say, uh, well, you'll ask, what do you want me to teach you? And they'll say, whatever the Lord leads. And what you normally do is just recycle something you've done before. Now, you try to pray about what the Lord wants to have you share, but still, it's a message usually that you've done before. A few days ago, I got an email from Pastor John, and he said, in order to keep our verse by verse going, would you teach on Nehemiah chapter 10? So I didn't have the privilege of recycling something. I actually had to work at it afresh. I know it's been a couple of weeks. Nehemiah chapter 8, though, as Neil mentioned, they heard the word of God. Nehemiah chapter 9. Very interesting. <laughs> they confessed their sins. I don't know if you've been around Christianity long enough, but confessing your sins is really not enough. You really need a chapter 10. And what happens in chapter 10 is they make a commitment. And it's a serious commitment. And that's the title. It was easy to title. You link chapter 10 with the last part of chapter 9. So if you have your Bible open, chapter 9, uh, verse 38. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant or a commitment. And write it. They wrote it down. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. Now, those who place chapter 10, verse 1, their seal on the document were, and I don't want you to expect me to read all those names because I'm not going to. <laughs> but it's a bunch of people. A bunch of people put their names on it and they sealed it. Then you go to verse 28. Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, the Nethanim. Uh, I'm teaching from the New King James Version because that's what you guys use. I have been using the New International Version. Some people call it the nearly inspired version, but I like it. I, it just reads very natural. And so when I pulled out the New King James, the word Nethanim, I'm like, I don't know what that means. I had to look it up. These are guys that assisted in the temple worship. So among those that made the commitment and put it in writing, basically was the church staff. So this message is for the church staff as well. And all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters. It was a family affair. Everyone who had knowledge and understanding. These joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath. In other words, cursed be us if we don't fulfill the commitment we're making. To walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God. And to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. Pause there. Lord, I pray, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And help us, Lord, to do what would be pleasing to you and good for us. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. I have a little bit of a PowerPoint, and there are four points, so you'll know when we're near the end of my time with you this morning for this service. And this first section, the commitment they make, is very specific. And here it is on the PowerPoint. Uh, we will live our lives according to the Word of God and not the culture 
of the world. That's exactly what we just read. Now, say it with me loudly, even if, even if you're not into it yet, go ahead and say it, and I promise you, if you all say it, I'll end on time. Are you ready? Say it. Here we go. We will live our lives according to the Word of God and not the culture of the world. I'm going to leave that up for just a minute because that's an amazing commitment. That's a serious commitment. They've separated themselves. They're not living in a commune. They're not living in a, a, a corner somewhere. But the idea is that they've been called out from the world unto the God of Israel, the true God. I know we're in a church service, but there could be somebody here. Uh, you've never made that initial commitment that I personally made 45 years ago. Amazing. 45 years ago, I knelt in my front yard. I asked God to forgive me of my sin. I asked Jesus to come into my life, and guess what? God forgave me, and Jesus came into my life, and it absolutely transformed me. Up until that time, what I was living for, I was living to party every day <laughs> and every night. I was living for rock and roll, and I was living for for I was living for the world. I, I, and, and let me tell you something. I had some really good times doing it. Look, who in the world ever said it was, it's not enjoyable to live in the world and live for the world? It, Moses, look, he chose, said no to the pleasures of the world. Pleasures of the world. And he made a decision to follow God. I made a decision 45 years ago to leave the lifestyle I was living, to leave the culture of the world, and I committed my life to Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, it, it was absolutely, I still get Jesus bumps to this day, 45 years later. Sometimes I, when I tell that, I, I feel like I'm getting saved all over again because I remembered it so well. I remember it so well. But between that commitment 45 years ago and today, there have been some challenges. There have been some challenges. I don't know how long for you, if you've made that commitment at some point in your life, but there are challenges. One of my friends said, and I don't know if he stole it from somebody else, but it's a great statement. I, I hand wrote it in my notes uh, this morning. The great challenge of the Christian life is that it is so daily. It is so daily. I've discovered that the majority of the characters in the Bible, in their walk of faith, in their lives of following God, it's a series over time of recommitments. You find some of the greatest men and women in the Bible. They got off course. Abraham. Abraham, he got off course. Moses, he got off course. And what do you have to do when he got off course? Because if you're the real deal, you get off course, and the Spirit of God begins to work in your life, and you get back on course. And the initial commitment you make that you're going to live according to the Word of God, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. I knew what that meant. I didn't know a lot about the Bible, but I knew I'm saying no now to my old life and new, uh, yes to a new life. And in 45 years, I've had to many times, many times, make a recommitment. That's the Christian life. It's a series of, of, of revival, personal revival. Almost 35 years ago, it'll be July the 26th. It's so wonderful I remember because my wife is here. Uh, Wendy, my wife, go ahead and stand. She's the best part of me. Go ahead and stand. Welcome Wendy, my wife. And almost 35 years ago, I stood before people, and a, and a guy named Jerry Falwell, believe it, if you knew who that was, you know, and that booming voice, he did our wedding. And I pledged everything when he said, I now pledge thee my troth. And I said, I, I didn't know what a troth was. I thought it was a trough. That's a true story. I'm not trying to be funny. 
But she got it. Whatever it was, she got it. And I, and I, until death do us part, I made a commitment 35 years ago. But let me tell you, along the, the path of marriage, uh, and thank God my wife doesn't have time to share this morning some of the challenges of our marriage, but we, I've had to make a recommitment. But thank God, one of the things I said, I said, I'll be true to her alone until death shall part us. I've kept that commitment. And thank God she hasn't been the one to kill me along the way. It's a series of commitments and recommitments. We're about to move on to the next one. But five years ago, five years ago, I made a commitment. As a pastor, as a seasoned pastor, I've been pastoring for years. I never planned on being a pastor of a big church, but I became a pastor of a big church. You know what happens when you become the pastor of a big, big church? There's a lot of challenges, a lot of headaches. I had a staff bigger than the, than the church when we first started. God drove me up the wall, and I hit a wall. And I was one of those pastors, a Calvary Chapel pastor, that, that among other Calvary Chapel pastors, especially in Europe, I'd, we'd have beer together. Did you hear what I just said? Beer. And I believed I had the freedom, and I believe still there are some Christians that have the freedom. But for me, listen, it became a problem. And five years ago, I made a commitment. I made a commitment because it became a habit. When I hit a wall in ministry and I was already having the freedom of having a beer or a glass of wine, and then it became a problem because, I, because of the challenges of ministry, and I was stupid. And stupid is as stupid does, and I was stupid. But I made a commitment five years ago. I'm not touching it ever again until I drink it with, with Jesus in the kingdom. And uh, you say, well, that's not alcoholic. Either way, we're going to drink it with him in the kingdom. <laughs> we're going to drink it with him in the kingdom. But I made a commitment five years ago. I'm telling you what, by the grace of God, I'm keeping that commitment until I see Jesus. And it never did anything for me. So look, first commitment. <laughs> you still awake? We will live our lives according to the word of God and not the culture of the world. And you make that commitment initially, but let me tell you, there's challenges along the way and you're going to have to recommit. But now, let's go back to the text. There's a second commitment they make. Woo, verse 30. We would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land. Nor take their daughters for our sons. If the peoples of the land, um, well, we'll stop with that one. That's the second commitment. It's a biggie. I put it this way on the PowerPoint. This is the second commitment. Say it with me. You ready? Uh, here we go. We will honor the holiness and purity of marriage. That's what we read. It wasn't a racial, racial thing. It was a spiritual thing. We're serving uh, the God of Israel, we're serving the true God, and so we're not going to intermarry with people that aren't serving our God. And this is a challenging commitment. Because the parents are saying, we're not going to put our blessing on a marriage that's not in keeping with God's Word and not in keeping with God being able to bless that marriage relationship. Here's what the writer of the Hebrews says, chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all. All. That's interesting. That includes unbelievers. John the Baptist pointed his finger in Herod's face and said, It's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Well, whose law is he talking about? Not Roman law. Talking about God's law. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now, sexually immoral. Let's leave that one up for just a minute, because I don't have to tell you, we're living in a culture where this is a tremendous challenge. I was recently in my hometown of Hartsfield, South Carolina. 
I got up early Sunday morning and I walked the streets of Hartsville. Didn't take long. It's not a big town. I discovered since my last trip, they've moved the police station from the old um, building to the old bank. Well, during my, <laughs> during my wild days uh, back then, you know, before I came to know Jesus Christ, uh, I knew the police station very well. And I walked around to the back of the police station because I had worked there. <laughs> that was part of my probation. And I won't tell you the things I did while I was working at the police station. Well, one of them, I stole the key to the gas pump at the police station. There were gas shortages in Hartsville back years ago. There were no gas shortages with me and my immediate friends. That's just a true story. And as I walked around behind the police station, the old police station, and they had moved now the pump. The pump was gone. But as I was kind of reminiscing on, and been thankful that those days were over and behind me, there was a police car sitting in the back. And I, I thought it was just, you know, one extra one that hadn't moved over to the new police station. And next thing I know, the window rolls down. And I go up and I start talking to the guy. And I, he's a younger guy, a policeman. And, uh, and I told him I'd grown up in Hartsville and told him my story. I said he used to work at the police station. And he got a little chuckle out of that. And, and the longer I talked to him, the more I found out about his life. And he's been living with his girlfriend for seven years. And I told him I was a pastor. And I said, next time I'm in town, I just offer, I'll do your wedding for free. Well, that's just a common thing now. chiropractor of mine a few months ago found out I was a pastor and he said my wife my 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 girl and I I think this is where he said it we've been looking for a church I just moved here from New York and they came and visited and they started visiting regularly and they wanted to dedicate their little child and so I met with them Found out they weren't married. I encouraged them. And as soon as I began to encourage them with the scriptures, the girl turned to the, the guy and said, we can leave now. Let's leave now. And she just kept saying that. And finally they got up and they left. And it was not a pleasant meeting. I haven't seen him back in our church fellowship. Years ago, a girl at Dillard's department store, I was shopping by myself, didn't have my wife. I'm... My wife, anything that matches on me, my wife, she did it. Well, I didn't have her with me, and the girl that was helping me in Dillard's, I was looking for some shirts like this, and they have them on sale once a year, and so I was going in to get a good deal, and a young lady was helping me, and I'm trying them on, and how do you think this looks, you know, and I got to know her a little bit. She was living with her boyfriend, and I said, well, I'm a pastor. I said, you know, why would you want to continue to live in sin? And I used that word. And she looked at me like I was from another planet. But let me tell you the toughest one, and I got a string of stories like any pastor who's been in ministry as long as me and Sean have. <laughs> We've got a lot of stories. But the toughest one was just a few years ago when one of my cousins, after going through a divorce, and I understand how tough that was for her. But she's living with her boyfriend and and I'm talking with her on the phone, and, and I encouraged her in regard to her lifestyle. And when I used the word sin, again, on, on the phone, sin, huh? And it, and it was a very awkward conversation. You know, it's possible somebody here in the church service, because we have it, pretty much all the time in our church service, somebody in the church service pretty much every week. And you're not honoring marriage. And the second commitment is, is to honor marriage. Well, let's get to the third because it's awful quiet in here, let me tell you. Let's, <laughs> let's go ahead and get to the third one. Um, chapter 10, Nehemiah. Uh, verse 31, if the peoples of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we would forgo the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. 
Wow. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures just to, to write down, and we don't have time to turn to them, but Exodus chapter 23, uh, verses 10 and 11. Actually, I'm going to uh, go against what I just said. I'm going to actually turn to that one, and I'm just going to read those couple of verses because it's where we get this next commitment from in the law. Exodus chapter 23, verse 10 Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce, but the seventh year uh, you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and olive grove. And then if you match that up with Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, uh, they were not to, in the seventh year, collect any debts that were owed to them. Now, what's this third commitment? Well, I put it on the PowerPoint like this. We will not allow greed to get a grip on our lives. This is a biggie too. All these commitments are big ones. Letting the land lie fallow was not just for the land's sake, but it's God creating a generous people as we just read from Exodus. So it was a faith thing. And it was a generosity thing. Faith and generosity and the opposite of uh, greed. Uh, I, I actually looked up and looked in a fresh definition of what greed is. And greed is intense and selfish desire for something. Something. So you want to have faith, trust God, uh, Seventh year, they were to let the land lie fallow. So you got to trust God to provide for you if you're going to obey what he says. That whole year, you're not planning, you're not producing. You're just going to trust God. But you're going to become a very generous person in the process. A very generous person. And so it's going to help you to not let greed grip your life. And the canceling of the debts... That one was an interesting one. We could expound more, but let me just say, that's something that is rightfully owed you. It's what somebody rightfully owes you. And God's saying, there comes a time where you just need to let it go. And I don't know if that means anything or says anything or speaks to anyone this morning. Years ago, I had the privilege of traveling with a guy named Kevin Spencer. We became a two-man magic team. He was the magician. He taught me some things. I used to get cut in half and all that kind of stuff. And we had a great time when we were younger. We traveled all over the place. We got a privilege of going to Australia for two summers, and we ministered in Australia with another whole ministry team. While in Australia, we bought two birds called galahs, better known as rose-breasted cockatoos. We came back from one trip after buying the birds. They had to stay in quarantine in Hawaii for 30 days, quarantine in Dallas for 30 days. We didn't get them for 60 days after we got back in the States. But when we came back, we had a layover in San Francisco. We went into this um, pet store in San Francisco in Fisherman's Wharf. And they had two rose-breasted cockatoos there in the pet store. They looked exactly like ours, which all of them pretty much looked the same. And we said, well, how much are you selling these for? And the manager said, $3,500. And we said, $3,500 a piece for, for two galahs? They said, no, $3,500 a piece. There's a point to the story. After we got back and finished our magic thing together, I felt led to go back and finish college because I had quit college to go and do this. And Kevin went on and continued doing the um, magic, ended up marrying one of the singers we traveled with, and they became a husband and wife magic team that traveled the world. And so in me going back to college and Kevin going on, we had to decide what to do with the bird. So we flipped a coin. He got one and I got the other. And then a few weeks after I got back to college, I got a letter from his lawyer saying that we bought the birds to be in the magic show and so they were rightfully both his birds. You know what I felt like doing? I felt like getting on a plane and going and squashing my friend's head. <laughs> and to shorten the story, I ended up getting bitter 
over something that I felt was rightfully mine. But one day I was so convicted, and I was working for the airlines in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I put that bird on a comat, company material, and I let Kevin know where the bird was going to be, and I shipped that bird to him, and as soon as that bird took off on that plane, the bitterness in my heart disappeared. I had to let it go. Maybe there's somebody here, there's something you just need to let go. Well, here's the fourth one. The fourth one's a lot of text, so go back with me to Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 32. Also, we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering. For the regular burnt offering on the Sabbaths, uh, new moons, the set feasts, for the holy things, the sin offerings, to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. We cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering. Let me pause just a minute and say there's no text in the law of Moses that requires a wood offering. Why do I stop and point that out? Because this wasn't something directly required in the law but it was something needed for the church, if you will. And so they did it. For bringing the wood offering into the house of our God, according to our Father's houses, at the appointed times year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground, and the first fruits of all the fruit, of all the trees year by year to the house of the Lord, to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priest who ministered in the house of our God, to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil, to the priest, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities. And the priest... The descendant of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes. So even the staff <laughs> is to do this. To the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. Last verse. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain, of the new wine and the oil, to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are. And we will not neglect the house of our God. I know that was a lot to read, but it really comes down to something fairly simple to understand. And here it is, number four. We will financially and wholeheartedly support the work of the church. Say that one with me. We will financially and wholeheartedly support the work of the church. It's much easier for a guest speaker to talk about this one. <laughs> the church is everything to me. I pray the church is everything to you, and if it's not, I pray it becomes everything to you. Going back to my first comments on the first commitment, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, nobody had to tell me, nobody had to convince me to be at church or to be involved in church. I was there for everything. Everything. I was, look, I did everything. I wanted to do everything. And when I heard a message on tithing, 10%, I had saved up a little money working after graduation from high school, and I gladly went and I wrote God a check. But I addressed it to the local church that I was a part of. And I have been doing that now. I've had the privilege of doing that now for 45 years. The church, the church. And, and you learn after a while, you know, especially as a pastor, the church is one of the most dysfunctional families in all of, all of the world. I mean, we're just messed up. We got a lot of issues. 
Calvary Chapel as a family. Lil, I've been in the Calvary Chapel family now, like your pastor John Spencer, for a long time. And let me tell you what, we're a dysfunctional group. <laughs> but we're still the church. I make no apology because the word of God, this is the final commitment, final commitment that I'm going to financially and wholeheartedly support the work of the church. Please, please, I beg you, I beg you, don't just attend church. You are missing out if all you're doing is coming here in a routine every Sunday. You're missing out. And I understand people's schedules may be challenging, but as much as you can, every time you can, you do more than just come sit and put your butt prints in that seat. Get involved. When you hear an announcement, when you see on the video announcements an opportunity to serve, then don't just go back and play golf or do whatever you want to do. Find a place and get plugged in and get involved. And every paycheck and every increase, one of the first things you ought to do is write a check to God or go online. And I finally arrived in the technological world, and now mine comes out of my paycheck automatically, and it goes to God by way of Calvary Chapel Fellowship. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Did I say it's wonderful? Man, make the church a part of your life, a part of your family. Hey, Dad, what? You think it's going to make a difference if all you do in front of your family is attend a church service? No. But if you make church your life. And there's no contradiction to say the church is my life and my family is number one as well. They're not a contradiction. Well, that's it. <laughs> Pretty simple, huh? One of my favorite authors, you can take that down, thank you. One of my favorite authors is a guy named Mark Batterson. I don't know if that name means anything to you, but he's written several books. I love his books. And he wrote this one a few years ago called All In. All In. Let me read you just a little section in closing. In the 16th century, the Renaissance astronomer Nicholas Copernicus challenged the belief that the earth was the center of the universe. Copernicus argued that the sun didn't revolve around the earth, but rather that the earth revolved around the sun. The Copernican revolution turned the scientific world upside down by turning the universe inside out. In much the same way, each one of us needs to experience our own Copernican revolution. The paradigm shift happens when we come to terms with the fact that the world doesn't revolve around us. That's a tough pill to swallow. When we're born into this world, the world revolves around us. We're spoon-fed on the front end and diaper changed on the back end. It's as if the entire world exists to meet our every need. And that's fine if you're a two-month-old baby. But if you're 22, it's a problem. Newsflash, <laughs> you are not the center of the universe. Ah, at its core, sinfulness is selfishness. It's enthroning yourself, your desires, your needs, your plans above all else. You may still seek God, but you don't seek Him first. You seek Him second or third or seventh. You may sing Jesus is at the center of it all, but what you really want is for people to bow down to you as you bow down to Christ. It's a subtle form of selfishness that masquerades as spirituality, but is not Christ-centric. It's me-centric. It's less about us serving His purposes and more about Him serving our purposes. And then Mark says, I call it the inverted gospel. Most people, listen, most people in most churches think they are following Jesus, but I'm not so sure. They may think they are following Jesus, but the reality is this. They've invited Jesus to follow them. They call him Savior, but they've never surrendered to him as Lord. And he says, I was one of them. Trust me, I didn't want to go anywhere without Jesus right there behind me. I wanted Jesus to follow me to serve my purposes, to do my will. 
Another page, he says the word consecrate means to set yourself apart. By definition, consecration means full devotion. It's dethroning yourself and enthroning Jesus Christ. It's the complete divestiture of all self-interest. It's giving God veto power. Surrendering all of you to all of him. For the sake of simplicity, let me give you my personal definition of consecration. Consecration is going all in and all out for the all in all. They told me I'm supposed to wrap up by 1020. Guess what time it is according to that? It's 1013. I have seven minutes. I'm going to drive the techie guys crazy when I walk off the stage like this. You know what's in this bag? Something I picked up at Walmart last night right down the road. I got a hundred three by five cards. You know what I got here? A bunch of pens. Here's my invitation. And while we sing, you want to do, you want to literally do what they did in the text? You want to literally do it? What did they do? They made a serious commitment. And you know what they did when they made the commitment? They wrote it down. Here's my invitation. You want to make a commitment. It may be a commitment that has nothing to do directly with the four points of Nehemiah 10. But the Spirit of God is working in your life and you know you need to make a commitment. And you know what the commitment is. And here's what I'm inviting you to do. Write it down. Put a date on it. And before this day is out, share it with someone close to you. That's what they did. They did it publicly. They were so serious about their commitment. They wrote it down. So while we sing, I'm going to stand here. I got pens. I got three by five cards. You take it. You take the pen. You take the three by five card. You go and write down your commitment. And then before the day's out, and you could do it even before the church service is out. You may be sitting with someone, you go, write it down, you turn to them and say, here, here it is. When I made a commitment to my wife, it's recorded. When I made a commitment five years ago to stop alcohol, I went public. There's something about going public that's really helpful. Okay? So, while we're seated, can slip out while we sing come on come on I got the pants come on come on while we sing